It was June of 1988, and 71-year-old Myra Davis could hardly contain her excitement. Just when she thought her working days were over, the former Hollywood actress was suddenly back in the entertainment business. As Myra stepped out the front door of her modest home in Cheviot Hills, California, the attractive grandmother with the high cheekbones and easy smile wasted no time in heading for the garage at the back of her property. During her 50-year-long career in show business, Myra had developed a reputation for being punctual, reliable, and hardworking. And even though her days of appearing in Hollywood movies were over, her career starring in commercial TV ads had just begun. And Myra, ever the professional, was determined to build just as good a reputation in her new line of work as she had built in her old line of work. Walking briskly down the driveway to the car parked in the garage at the back of her property, Myra made a note of not looking over at her neighbor's house. She didn't want her good mood spoiled by the sight of the owner's teenage son staring out his window at her. A minute or so later, and Myra had slipped behind the wheel of her tan and brown Chevrolet Malibu, turned the key in the ignition, and was backing out of her driveway onto her quiet residential street. As Myra pulled away from the single-story white bungalow and headed west to the city of Los Angeles, she couldn't help but think of all the changes she had seen during her 40 years in that house and in the entertainment business she loved so much. Myra knew that she was incredibly lucky to have had a career in Hollywood that spanned more than 46 years, let alone this second chance now as an older woman to get regular employment with TV ad agencies. But then again, not everyone who headed for Hollywood would have been satisfied with the kind of practical career decisions Myra had always made for herself. Because the key to Myra's success was the fact that she had kept her ambitions fairly modest, and she never yielded to the temptations and distractions of fame, drugs, alcohol, or scandalous affairs. The same had not been true of her husband. After having achieved moderate success as a cowboy actor when Myra met and married him in 1934, Robert Davis died of an overdose 37 years later. And over the course of that long and often troubled marriage, not only did Myra take care of the couple's two sons, she was also the one who kept getting offers of more work. In fact, ever since Myra had left her hometown of Albuquerque, New Mexico at the age of 14, migrated to California, and landed a bit part with Hollywood Studio, she'd carved out a niche for herself not as a famous actress, but as someone whose role was to support those famous actresses. After starting out as a dancer, Myra soon shifted gears from what studio called first teamwork, which was done by leading actors and actresses, to second team technical assistance that rarely resulted in getting your name listed in any film credits. Even though she still took the occasional role as a dancer or made an on-camera cameo appearance, Myra's bread and butter had quickly become her work as a stand-in or body double. A body double is someone who actually replaces the star during filming. A stand-in is a person who replaces the star during the setup of movie scenes, when lighting, camera, and sound technicians spend hours preparing for or rehearsing an actual scene. As Myra loved to tell her 32-year-old granddaughter, Myra had preferred being a stand-in, because stand-ins nearly always got steady work, and because Myra didn't do any nude work like many body doubles did. At the thought of her granddaughter, Myra smiled. With Myra's help and encouragement, Sherry had followed in her grandmother's footsteps, and by the age of 19, Sherry was also getting regular work in Hollywood. Now 32, Sherry had actually eclipsed Myra's career. Sherry had more in-front-of-the-camera acting roles than she did behind-the-scenes stand-in work. But, as far as Myra's granddaughter was concerned, it was still Myra's work on one of the most iconic and famous horror movies in history that was her family's crowning Hollywood achievement. That movie was the 1960 thriller titled Psycho. Shot in black and white and directed by the legendary Alfred Hitchcock, Psycho is best known for its gruesome murder scene. In that scene, the character, who was played by actress Janet Lee, is stabbed to death while taking a shower. Although Myra was not the body double who did the nude work in that famous shower scene, Myra did spend weeks on set standing in for Janet Lee during the shower scene lighting setups. And Myra also played the on-camera part of the murderer, who shows up in the movie as a shadowy knife-wielding figure on the other side of the almost but not quite transparent shower curtain. In real life, Myra could not have been more different from that character. Among family and friends, she was known for her kindness and generosity, as well as the upbeat attitude with which she had faced the hardships in her life and career. 
But even though Myra continued to work as a stand-in and body double right through the late 1970s, it was still her appearance in Psycho that seemed to define her career. None of her roles before or after ever matched the reaction Myra got when people knew that she had worked on that shower scene with Janet Lee. And in 1977, when Myra finally retired at the age of 61, it would take all of that resilience and optimism to adjust to the reality that as much as she loved the entertainment industry, the movies, and the people she had met, she would never again appear either in front of or behind the camera on a Hollywood movie set. But just over a year earlier, all that had changed. Just as Myra had been the person who introduced her granddaughter to a career in show business, it had been her granddaughter, Sherry, who had only recently introduced her grandmother to the talent agents who went on to hire Myra to play a leading role in commercial TV ads. Now, joining the flow of cars all streaming into Los Angeles that morning, Myra's memories of the past gave way to the satisfaction she felt right this moment. Whether she was in a backstage dressing room in Hollywood having a cup of coffee with Janet Lee, or pitching homestyle cookies or rental cars on TV, it was all showbiz to Myra. Gripping the wheel of her car a little tighter, Myra glanced at her watch. She had just enough driving time left to do a few mental run-throughs of that day's script before she arrived at the TV studio. A few weeks later, at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday, July 3rd, Sherry Davis pulled into the driveway of her grandmother's white bungalow at 2917 South Beverly Drive. An hour earlier, Myra's son and Sherry's uncle out in Idaho had called Sherry to say he could not get in touch with Myra, and would Sherry just drive in person to Myra's house to make sure there was nothing wrong. And as soon as Sherry drew her car to a stop and saw the stack of newspapers piled up against her grandmother's front door, an alarm bell started going off in Sherry's mind. Myra, who loved to do the daily crossword puzzle in the newspapers, would never let her newspapers pile up like that, any more than she would leave her tan and brown Chevy Malibu parked outside the garage long enough to gather the thick layer of dust Sherry was seeing on the car right now as she now made her way to the front door of her grandmother's house. Even though Sherry could see a light on just inside the house, the door was locked, and even after knocking and ringing the bell and calling out to her grandmother that it was her, Sherry, there was no answer, and no sound of movement from inside the house. Sherry's chest suddenly felt tight. She knew her grandmother rarely left the house before noon unless she had a work assignment. Moving several steps to her right, Sherry saw that the curtains were still drawn over the big six-pane glass front window that looked into the living room. That wasn't like Myra either. She kept her ground-level bedroom drapes closed, but opening the curtains in other rooms meant she could keep the overhead lights off and save a little on her electric bill. Walking around to the back of the house, Sherry went to the one window that she knew was always unlocked and uncovered. It was a small pane of glass set high up on the exterior wall of Myra's bedroom. Myra always left it uncovered so her beloved cats could sit inside on the sill and look out at the world. A few moments later, standing on top of an outdoor table she had positioned below that small opening, Sherry was looking down at her grandmother's bed. And what Sherry saw was so horrifying, she had to catch herself to keep from falling. And even after Sherry had jumped off that low table and run back to the front of the house, she was still trying to process what she'd just glimpsed through that window. For a second, Sherry looked over at the neighbor's house. But instead of asking them for help, Sherry jumped into her car and, when she couldn't find a payphone near her grandmother's house, she drove as fast as she could back to Playa del Rey where her house was. Stumbling in through the front door, Sherry told her husband, John, exactly what she had seen. By the time first responders had arrived at Myra's house on South Beverly Drive that Sunday morning, Sherry's husband was there to meet them. Unlike Sherry, John had brought the keys to Myra's house with him, and a moment later, the emergency medical technicians had unlocked the door to the little white bungalow. But it would turn out that the medics and police were much, much too late to help Myra. The 71-year-old grandmother lay on her bed, the bedspread and sheets bunched underneath her. Naked from the waist down, her belly was distended, and her maggot-infested body was already in an advanced stage of decomposition. A little over an hour before, when Sherry had looked through the small window into her grandmother's bedroom and seen her grandmother's swollen and lifeless body, 
Sherry had told herself that Myra must have died of a heart attack or some other natural cause, and that the condition of her body must be due to the fact that Myra had been lying there undiscovered for days. But Sherry's assumption had been wrong. There had been nothing natural at all about her grandmother's death. According to police, the woman who now lay on that rumpled bed and who had once famously played the role of the murderer in the hit movie Psycho, had herself been violently raped and then strangled to death with a pair of her own nylon stockings. Cheviot Hills, where Myra lived, was not a high crime area. Located west of Los Angeles, it was a modest but affluent neighborhood that had, over the years, been home to many actors like Myra and her husband. With its views of the local golf course and country club, it was a place where residents felt safe and where murders like this just did not happen. But despite the public pressure to find and punish the person who killed Myra, right from the start, the investigation into her death was complicated, not only by the delay in discovering Myra's body, but also by a lack of suspects and obvious motives. By the time Los Angeles detective Gary Fullerton began his investigation into Myra's homicide, collecting physical evidence, swabbing the body for DNA, snapping pictures, and dusting for fingerprints, the medical examiner's autopsy report estimated that Myra had already been dead for eight days. And looking at the crime scene, Detective Fullerton's first assumption was that Myra had been the victim of a random burglary, meaning she may not have had any personal connection to her killer. To Detective Fullerton, it looked like someone had rifled through Myra's nightstand and ransacked her dresser. In addition, the contents of Myra's purse were scattered across the bedspread and floor. But Sherry, who was absolutely stunned to find out that her grandmother had been murdered, had no trouble at all coming up with a potential suspect. Within hours of her grandmother's death, Sherry had directed police attention to the house immediately adjacent to Myra's property. Although it was no larger than Myra's own small three-bedroom home, the neighbor's house seemed to be overflowing with people. At any given time, the owner, a woman named Adrienne Rosenfeld, played host to up to eight different residents. Those included Adrian's older teenage son, her two adult daughters, and their partners, along with three of Adrian's grandchildren. According to Sherry, both she and her grandmother had suspected Adrian's son, Joel Steen, of spying on them from his bedroom window, as well as making unwanted advances and visits to the house when Sherry was visiting her grandmother. Sherry said that Myra had even gone so far as to say that she was actively afraid of the young man. Sherry herself was uncomfortable enough with his behavior that even after discovering her grandmother's body, Sherry did not want to ask anyone in that house if she could use their phone to call 911. As for the other occupants of that house, Sherry said her grandmother got along well enough with Adrian, who owned a nearby nail salon, and aside from the family's constant bickering, neither Sherry or her grandmother had had any issues with the older daughter's husband or the younger daughter's boyfriend who did odd jobs around the neighborhood. But what seemed like a promising first lead quickly led to what would become a series of dead ends. After interviewing Adrian and her family members and guests and checking their alibis, Detective Fullerton eventually came back to Myra's family and said he'd cleared everyone, including Adrian's son, of any involvement. Instead, based on conversations with an assortment of neighbors, as well as some of Myra's family members and people she knew through her work at the TV studio, the detective had a new name at the top of his suspect list, and that person was none other than Sherry's own younger brother. According to Myra's neighbors, Myra's 31-year-old grandson, a known drug abuser who had a history of asking Myra for money, had recently been living at Myra's house. And although Myra's grandson would later provide investigators with an alibi and pass a lie detector test, he would remain a person of interest to the Los Angeles police force, especially when every other lead that Detective Fullerton pursued in the weeks that followed came up completely empty. And months later, when the Myra Davis murder case ground to a halt and the murder file was quietly shelved alongside dozens of other unsolved cold cases handled by the Los Angeles County Police Department, Sherry's brother remained under that cloud of suspicion. Ten years later, early on the afternoon of Sunday, March 29, 1998, 38-year-old Debbie McAllister picked up the telephone. 
She was sitting in her home in San Clemente, a city of 47,000 people that was perched right on the white sand beach of California's southern coast. Once again, Debbie dialed the number of her mother's apartment 90 miles north in West Los Angeles, a residential area not far from Cheviot Hills. And once again, at the other end of the line, she heard the busy signal. Debbie's mother, Jean Orloff, had called Debbie earlier that day to fill Debbie in on news about a mutual acquaintance. At the time, Debbie, a single working mom with a 15-year-old son, had been swamped with household chores. Not wanting to miss any of the details, Debbie had told her mom that Debbie would call back that afternoon when both of them could settle in for an unhurried conversation. Now, putting the telephone receiver back in its cradle, Debbie pushed the first flicker of worry out of her mind. Maybe her mother had taken the phone off the hook while she went down to do laundry in the basement of her apartment complex and then forgotten to hang the receiver back up before going out to visit with one of her many friends. But still, it seemed a little unusual then again, Debbie certainly did not know all the ins and outs of her mom's weekend routine. Although the two women were very close, their relationship was complicated. Jean had divorced Debbie's father when Debbie was just two years old and Jean was in her early 20s. Twelve years after that, Jean had left their extended family in New York and moved with Debbie out to Los Angeles, California. Once on the West Coast, Jean had worked hard to support the two of them. And as soon as they had settled into the one-bedroom unit in a modern apartment complex on Bentley Ave, where Jean still lived, Debbie had spent a lot of time alone and unsupervised. Jean had known the arrangement was not ideal, but it was the only way that Jean could work during the day and attend a night course that would allow her to get certified and employed as a surgical dental assistant. Jean Orloff had never remarried, but she had always had plenty of admirers and Debbie knew how much her mother prided herself on her youthful appearance. Nature had blessed Jean with thick dark hair, blue-green eyes, and a good figure, and Jean always made sure that her makeup and manicured nails were perfect. By the time she was closing in on 40, Jean had begun a long-term relationship with a wealthy young man in his 20s, and having a 17-year-old daughter in the one-bedroom apartment led to just enough friction between the two women that Debbie decided at that point to move out and begin living on her own. When Debbie's son, Andrew, was born six years later, Debbie had wondered how her mother would adjust to the idea that she was now old enough to be a grandmother, a title that definitely challenged Jean's determination to look and act as young as she felt. But it would turn out that Jean absolutely loved little Andrew, and as she leaned hard into her role as grandmother, any strain between Jean and Debbie had faded. Despite the 90-mile distance between them, Jean often used the weekend to make the two-hour drive south to San Clemente. She would pack her bag and hop into her beloved red-and-white Chevrolet Malibu that she had bought for herself more than 20 years ago. Then she'd roll down the windows and head for the coast, full of plans for how she and Andrew would spend the next couple of days. Now, almost 15 years after Andrew's arrival, Debbie knew that her mother had just passed two more difficult milestones. Just five months earlier, Jean had turned 60 and had officially joined the ranks of older Americans. But even worse, the man Jean had been seeing for almost 20 years had announced that he'd asked another, much younger woman to marry him. Overall, though, Debbie had the sense that her mom was meeting these challenges with her usual resilience. From a practical standpoint, Debbie knew that her mother was independent and self-sufficient. The local Avon lady, who sold makeup and skincare products to Jean at her home, was married to a man who could help Jean with any minor repairs around her apartment. And from a social perspective, Jean was keeping herself upbeat and busy. Not long ago, her mom and her mom's good friend, Barbara Capital, had gone to the Los Angeles Dodgers Stadium to hear Jean's favorite rock and roll band, the Rolling Stones. And in late October, just a few days after turning 60, Jean and Barbara had gone to an elaborate Halloween party that was put on each year by Jean's manicurist. And in February, just one month earlier, Jean had booked tickets for a trip she and Andrew would take to Disney World later that year. And just 11 days earlier, Debbie knew that Jean, along with Jean's younger sister and their mother, had gotten together for lunch a monthly engagement that had started after Debbie's aunt and grandmother had joined Jean and Debbie out on the West Coast. Finally, Debbie told herself to stop worrying. It was good that her mom was busy or having a marathon phone call with a friend. 
And besides, her mom had sounded just fine when Debbie talked with her earlier that morning. At about 5 p.m. the next day, on the afternoon of Sunday, March 29th, Jean's friend, Barbara, left her apartment in the complex that she and Jean shared and climbed the one flight of steps up to Jean's unit. Both women lived alone, and over the years, they had become very good friends. So it was natural that when Jean's mother had not been able to reach her daughter by phone at all that day, that Jean's mother would finally call Barbara and ask her to check that Jean was okay. But it wasn't until Barbara saw the Sunday newspaper still on the floor outside Jean's door and Jean did not answer the bell that Barbara felt her own first wave of concern. And when Barbara tried the door and found it swung inward under her hand, that concern turned to alarm. Jean was always careful to keep her doors locked. And even when she was expecting company, Jean always used an intercom and buzzer to greet people before letting them inside. The first thing Barbara noticed when she walked into Jean's apartment was the smell of smoke. Not from Jean's cigarettes, but more the smell of fabric burning. But even as Barbara pinned what the smell was down, she came to a sudden, horrified stop. The door to Jean's bedroom was open, and from where Barbara stood just a few feet away, she could see Jean's naked body sprawled face down across the king-sized bed. Jean's feet, hanging over the edge of the mattress, were blue, there was blood around Jean's head, and then Barbara saw the source of the smoky smell she had noticed when she first walked in. The dust ruffle around the bottom of the bed had been partially burned, and even though the fire had burned itself out, there was something so off about Jean's lifeless and discolored body that Barbara did not have to check for a pulse to know that her friend was dead. And even as Barbara began to back out of the apartment before turning to run down the stairs to her own unit, where she would call 911, other details of the scene seared themselves into Barbara's memory. The way Jean's body looked like it had been thrown onto the bed, the phone on the floor rather than on the nightstand, and the receiver off its cradle. Then there was the uncharacteristically messy pile of towels heaped on the floor in the bathroom instead of folded neatly on the towel racks and that blood around her friend's long, dark hair. And as Barbara picked up the phone and dialed 911, her brain kept screaming one single word, murder. But within the next hour, as first responders from the fire, police, and emergency medical unit flooded into the apartment complex on Bentley Avenue, Los Angeles County Police Sergeant Christopher Giles was forming a very different impression of what had caused the death of 60-year-old Jean Orloff. After observing Jean's body and learning that Jean was a heavy smoker and that she took heart medication, Detective Giles announced that the victim had likely died of natural causes like a heart attack and that the fire must have been caused by Jean dropping a lit cigarette. This assessment was met with blank silence before the fire captain, whose crew had also responded to the 911 call, pointed out to the detective that people who die of heart attacks are usually found lying face up, not face down. The fire captain also pointed to a red crease on Jean's neck. And to him, not only did the fact that the phone was off the hook seem unusual and possibly suspicious, the burned bed skirt looked more like a deliberate arson attempt than an accidental fire. But not only did Detective Giles dismiss those concerns, the county coroner would later agree with Detective Giles and rule that Jean had, in fact, died of a heart attack. So, on March 30th, 1998, one day after Barbara had discovered Jean's body, Jean's sister and her sister's husband arrived at the morgue, grief-stricken by Jean's unexpected and tragic death, to make arrangements for Jean's body to be cremated. And that would have been the end of any further investigation into the death of Jean Orloff, if not for the work of a sharp-eyed public official who noticed two important errors in the paperwork provided by the county coroner's office. It turned out that Jean's own doctor did not believe that Jean's heart condition was serious enough to have caused a fatal heart attack, and he had refused to sign off on the coroner's death certificate. Not only that, but no one from the coroner's office had ever examined Jean's body at her apartment or filed an official record of Jean's death. So, on April 2nd, five days after Jean's body had been discovered and one day after her grieving family had gone forward with her memorial service, an investigator with the coroner's office arrived at the morgue to do a second examination of Jean's body before releasing her remains to the family. 
But as soon as the investigator arrived at the morgue and opened the plastic cover that encased Gene Orloff's dead body, he knew that there would be nothing routine about the examination of this body. The red crease that the fire captain had noticed on Gene's neck had deepened to a dark purple bruise. There was also a trail of bruises from Jean's cheekbones down to her lower legs, and tiny red spots filled the whites of Jean's eyes. It was instantly clear to the investigator that Jean had not died of natural causes. She had been strangled to death. Not only would an autopsy confirm this, it would also show that Jean had been sexually assaulted. And even before that autopsy was completed, a new investigation into Jean's death was underway. This time, the lead detectives were two highly respected police officers, Francine Maunger and Ron Phillips. And together, they wasted no time interviewing and fingerprinting the stunned members of Jean's family and Jean's circle of social and work contacts. The first hurdle facing investigators was the fact that they had no crime scene. Because Jean's death had initially been attributed to natural causes, her apartment had been thoroughly cleaned and all her belongings packed away in boxes. So, without a crime scene or any physical evidence to guide them, Detectives Maunger and Phillips immediately turned to the most obvious suspects. In any homicide investigation, the victim's romantic partners and spouses are automatically people of interest. But in this case, Jean's much younger boyfriend had a rock-solid alibi, and no one who knew Jean, either from her work or personal life, seemed to have any motive for wanting her dead. Knowing they needed to think outside the box if they were going to solve this case, Detective Maunger decided it was time to talk with the one person in a woman's life who might know more about her than even her closest friends. And that person was Jean's longtime beautician. Detective Maunger explained it to her partner this way. Being female, I know we talk about our lives to our hairdressers and manicurists. We use them as sounding boards. And on Tuesday, April 7th, the same day that Detective Maunger set off to talk with this new potential witness, investigators received a telephone call that changed everything. Within hours, police were combing through their backlog of cold cases, looking for the unsolved murder of a 71-year-old woman named Myra Davis, who had also lived in Cheviot Hills, and who had been raped and then strangled 10 years earlier. The tip that would help break these two murder cases came from a parole agent for the California Department of Corrections. According to John Widener, one of the released prisoners he supervised, a man who had served jail time for committing forgery, had heard about Jean Orloff's murder. And not only did the details of her death, sexual assault, and strangulation remind this ex-con of another earlier murder, but this ex-con also knew the name of one man who had a connection to both victims. 24 hours later, the pieces of two murder puzzles, along with a string of seemingly unrelated sex crimes that had happened in the late 1980s, suddenly and shockingly all fell into place. Over the weeks that followed, the names and images of Gene Orloff and Myra Davis, along with references to the 1960 horror classic Psycho, all started appearing in the pages and on the screens of state and then national media. Based on information contained in both those murder files, along with Detective Maunger's interview with Jean's manicurist and a series of interviews with the suspect named by the parole agent, here is a reconstruction of what happened on or about Tuesday, June 28, 1988, when 71-year-old Myra Davis was killed, and on March 29, 1998, 10 years later, when the same man murdered 60-year-old Jean Orloff. Back in 1988, Myra's killer had already developed a very unwholesome fascination with women and violence. And Myra, a vulnerable older woman he saw every day, had become an object of great interest to him. He knew a little bit about her, including the fact that she didn't seem to much like her neighbors, at least not all of them. He also knew she had made a living in Hollywood back when she was young and that now she made commercials. He'd even seen her face on ads pitching old-time lemonade and the all-day breakfast served at the International House of Pancakes. He knew she had a very good-looking granddaughter who also worked in Hollywood, but on that day in late June 1988, neither the neighbors or Myra's granddaughter were anywhere in sight. So when the murderer knocked on Myra's door and called out respectfully if now was a good time for him to come visit, there was no one to see them when Myra opened the back door, gave him that TV smile, and invited him inside. 
There was also no one to see when the killer followed Myra out of the kitchen and into her bedroom. And Myra was surprised when, after their short but pleasant conversation had ended, she turned around and there he was, standing right behind her with a strange look on his face. For the killer, the explosive rage and sexual excitement that now filled him was familiar. They had been among the reasons why parents wanted nothing to do with him, why he had molested his own younger sister, why he had spent years in mental hospitals and juvenile detention facilities, and why he had sexually abused other children in those same settings. Myra had no way of knowing any of this. The killer's long rap sheet listing crimes he'd committed before the age of 18, when he was still considered a child, was protected by law from public view. And at that moment, knowing what her killer was capable of would not have mattered to the 71-year-old grandmother anyway. Because now it was too late. This man was already there in her house, and when he suddenly came at her, the attack was so unexpected that Myra hardly had any time to process what was happening or to try to protect herself. According to the medical examiner's later autopsy report, what happened next was premeditated and brutal. Myra's killer stripped her of nearly all of her clothes and then forced her onto the bed where he raped her. Afterward, her killer wrapped a pair of nylon stockings around Myra's neck, then used the handle of a plastic pot scrubber he'd picked up on his way through the kitchen, like a tourniquet, to tighten the ligature around her throat. Throughout the attack, Myra was facing her killer. In the 60 to 90 seconds it took her to die from strangulation, the small bone below her jaw and inside her neck had slowly fractured. At the same time, the intense pressure on Myra's voice box caused her to reflexively bite down into her own tongue, even as the blood vessels in her eyes and under her skin and gums began to rupture and bleed. Before leaving Myra's house, the killer rifled through her purse and quickly opened and ransacked the five drawers of her bedroom dresser. Satisfied and exhilarated, the killer slipped out the door of Myra's house, leaving her body to the maggots and California's summer heat. Over the next week, Myra's killer spent several days on an alcohol-fueled bender. But by the time he was interviewed by police about Myra's death, he was sober and he had put together an alibi. He also knew he had been lucky. Myra's body was so badly decomposed by the time it was discovered that pinning down an exact date or time of death was practically impossible. And in the two years that followed the unsolved killing, police never connected Myra's murder with a string of at least six sexual assaults on young women in the Cheviot Hills area where Myra had lived. And when, in 1991, Myra's killer was arrested and charged with sexual battery in two of those attacks, the sentences against him were suspended, and instead of serving time, Myra's killer was put on probation and required to attend one year of sexual abuse counseling. The killer's next encounter with the law occurred on March 6, 1992, when an elderly couple out for a stroll in Cheviot Hills saw him kicking the small dog he was holding at the end of a leash. When the 67-year-old husband, who weighed less than 120 pounds, told the younger man to stop it, Myra's killer, enraged, stepped forward and struck the older man. The blow knocked him backward and he hit his head on the sidewalk with such force that three weeks later, he died. After spending three years in prison for manslaughter, Myra's killer was again released on parole. And moving back in with his wife, he started working side jobs for cash as a handyman. And by the beginning of 1998, one of his customers was an attractive and vibrant 60-year-old divorcee named Jean Orloff. Not only did Jean live just several blocks away from the killer's first murder victim, but Jean's red and white vintage Chevrolet Malibu reminded the murderer of the tan and brown Chevy Malibu that had belonged to Myra, and how that car had sat in Myra's driveway collecting dust during those seven days after he had killed her when she lay dead and undiscovered inside her little white bungalow. In fact, 10 years later, on March 28, 1998, there was so much about the visit he decided to make to Jean's apartment that would remind him of his visit to Myra a decade earlier. Like Myra, who was one of his early customers, Jean had always been happy to have his help around her home, starting back in late 1997 when he repainted a heavy mirror for her before hanging it over her piano. So when the killer had slipped away from his family's house that evening and driven the three miles to Jean's apartment where he knocked quietly on her door, Jean welcomed him inside with a smile. Like Myra, Jean had no reason not to open the door. 
Like Myra, Jean had no idea what crimes this man had already committed, and she had no idea what he was about to do to her. But once the killer attacked, Jean fought back with every ounce of strength she had. And even though Detective Giles would later insist that Jean had died of natural causes, the autopsy that doctors performed five days after Jean's body was sent to the morgue told a very different story. Like Myra, Jean had been raped. But blunt force trauma to the back of her ribcage showed that the killer had probably had to jam his knee into her back to force her face into the mattress so he could subdue her. The ultimate cause of death was strangulation, although in Jean's case, the ragged furrows around her neck, the crushed voice box, and the abrasion on her chin, nose, and next to her mouth all suggested that she had fought desperately against the tightening of the ligature. When it was over, the killer left his victim naked and face down on top of her bed. The phone already lay on the floor, the receiver off the hook. As the killer's excitement subsided and his breathing returned to normal, he could hear the faint noise of the busy signal coming across the phone line. Before leaving, the killer set a small fire at the bottom edge of the bed skirt. Taking one last look around, the killer slipped out of Jean's apartment, leaving the door unlocked behind him. And just a few minutes after that, 32-year-old Kenneth Dean Hunt, who had been known to both Myra and Jean by his nickname, Sonny, was in his car heading back to the home he shared with his wife and her mother on South Beverly Drive in Cheviot Hills. And that house, owned by Adrian Rosenfeld and still overflowing with people, was located right next door to the little white bungalow where Myra Davis had lived for 40 years before Sonny had killed her back in 1988. It would turn out that the 32-year-old handyman who murdered both Myra Davis and Jean Orloff had been the boyfriend of Adrian's younger daughter the man who made most of his money doing odd jobs for their neighbors. Four months after being interviewed and cleared as a possible suspect in Myra's murder, Sonny had gone on to marry Adrian's daughter. He had also cultivated a loving relationship with his mother-in-law. Adrian, along with her daughter, always found excuses for Sonny's inability to hold down a regular job, and they would both insist that later charges against him for sexual assault and manslaughter were unfounded. As Myra's neighbor, Adrian had made a point of recommending Sonny to Myra as a part-time handyman. And as the owner of a popular local beauty salon, Adrian made the same glowing recommendation to her older single female clients who also might appreciate the services of someone who could come to their home and do minor repairs and yard work. Once Sonny's wife began selling Avon products, he also worked as a delivery person personally taking orders directly to the homes of his wife's clients. One of those clients was Jean Orloff. Not only had Jean been a longtime customer at Adrian's nail salon, she had attended Adrian's big Halloween party in 1997. Jean also bought skin products from Adrian's daughter and hired Sonny as a part-time handyman. As for the tip that finally broke the two murder cases, that came from Adrian's son, Joel Steen. As a teenager, Joel may have creeped out Myra and her granddaughter Sherry with his unwanted attention, but it was a charge of forgery, not stalking, that would eventually land him in prison for a few years before he got out on parole. Unlike his mother, Joel had always suspected Sonny might have been involved in Myra's murder, especially when Sonny went on that bender in the days immediately after Myra's death. So, when Joel heard the eerily similar details of Jean's murder and observed that following Jean's murder, Sonny went on another substance-fueled bender, Joel picked up the phone, called his parole officer, and suggested that police might want to take a look at Kenneth Hunt, a.k.a. Sonny. Meanwhile, Detective Maunger's interview with Jean's manicurist, Adrian Rosenfeld, would also lead investigators to make a direct link between Sonny and his two murder victims. And unlike the general public, investigators would also have access to Sonny's juvenile records that would detail his lengthy and disturbing history of violence and sexual assault. Samples of Sonny's semen would later match the samples collected from the bodies of both Myra and Jean. On Thursday, April 9, 1998, less than two weeks after Jean's murder, Kenneth Sonny Hunt was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder, burglary, and forcible rape. In yet another strange twist to this case, in the press coverage that surrounded Sonny's arrest, 
His first victim, Myra Davis, was wrongly identified not as a stand-in on the set of the movie Psycho, but as the body double who actually appeared nude in the shower scene that made the movie famous. That mistake led to speculation that Sonny had been obsessed with killing that body double who he believed, incorrectly, to be his next-door neighbor. True or not, the mistake brought a kind of notoriety to Myra Davis that the modest 71-year-old grandmother had never pursued or wanted in the course of her half-century-long career in Hollywood. On March 15, 2001, Kenneth Dean Hunt, aka Sonny, was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder. Eight months later, on November 6th, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. On Sunday, August 26, 1990, a 56-year-old woman named Patricia Powell and her husband, Frank, pulled into a parking lot right outside of this beautiful three-story apartment complex in Gainesville, Florida. Gainesville is this beautiful little town in northern Florida that is home to the massive University of Florida, which is known for their big-time football team and their big-time college party scene. Patricia and Frank's daughter, 17-year-old Christine, was going to be a freshman that year at the University of Florida. And apparently, she had been so excited after getting her acceptance letter that her dad, Frank, had gone out and got a gold necklace for her that had the school's mascot, an alligator, dangling from it. And Christine wore it all the time. Two days earlier, Christine and her new roommate, 18-year-old Sonia Larson, the two had actually met over the summer when they took some summer classes together, they had actually already come to Gainesville and they had moved in to this white apartment complex that Patricia and Frank were now parked outside of. And after unpacking some of their things in their apartment, Christine and Sonia had left and gone into town and grabbed a bite to eat at a local restaurant. And then afterwards, Christine had used a payphone to call back home and tell her parents how well it was going and how much she already enjoyed her roommate and how excited she was for the year. And she told Patricia and Frank that she would call them the following day. But the following day came and went, and Patricia and Frank did not hear from their daughter. And they had no way to actually call her because she had not set up her landline in her apartment. But Patricia and Frank, they told each other that, of course, everything was fine. You know, she just got to college. She's excited. She's probably out having a good time, and she just forgot to call. And anyways, Patricia and Frank had already planned a visit to see their daughter in Gainesville the next day, which was Sunday. And so fast forward back to that Sunday and Patricia and Frank are now parked outside of their daughter's apartment complex. They still haven't heard from her, but they're still telling themselves everything's fine. She's probably just busy. And so they get out of their car and they walk over to the building and they go through one of the front access doors that brings them into the building. They find themselves inside of this carpeted stairwell where at every level on the way up, there were doors leading off to each of the apartments. They made their way up to the second level where they knew their daughter's apartment was and they walk up to her door and before they even knock or turn the doorknob or anything, they notice on the door there are all these notes, these handwritten notes that have been taped all over it. And they read a couple of them and they were notes from some of Christine and Sonia's friends on campus that apparently had tried to stop by over the last weekend but had not been able to make contact with Christine or Sonia. And so these notes said things like, hey Christine, you know, we came over to try to get you to come out with us but you didn't come to the door so we left without you, sorry you know, give us a call when you get in. And so obviously the parents are totally worried given the circumstances. They don't know where their daughter is. They've been telling themselves everything is fine. And now these notes make it seem like everything is not fine. But the parents, they keep their cool and they just start knocking on the door and calling out for their daughter but there's no answer. And so Patricia and Frank, they start to panic at this point and they leave the carpeted stairwell. They go outside and they find a maintenance worker that works for this building and they explain their situation with their daughter and how they can't get in touch with her and can he please let them in to make sure she's okay. The maintenance worker said he couldn't without speaking to his manager. And so he goes to his manager and the manager, she says, that's fine, but we need to get the police involved. They need to escort us into the apartment. And so the maintenance worker calls the police and requests this escort court and a few minutes later a single Gainesville police officer arrives at the apartment complex and he tells Patricia and Frank that just as a precaution I need you guys to stay outside so they stay right outside those front access doors they're outside of the apartment building and then this officer along with the maintenance worker and the manager of the building those three they go inside the stairwell they go up to the second floor and at that point the maintenance worker gets out his keys he finds the right one and he opens Christine and Sonia's door 
The door swings open and immediately the police officer yells out for the two girls, but there's no answer. And so the officer is first into the apartment, which basically immediately opens up to their living room. And in the middle of the living room is a couch that's angled towards the right side of the room where a TV had been set up. And so the officer, again, as he walks in, he's calling out, trying to get the girl's attention, but there's no answer. Behind him is the maintenance worker and the building manager. And they begin making their way towards the right side of the living room over towards that TV to see if maybe someone was laying on the couch. And as they round that corner and can finally actually see the front of the couch, the maintenance worker, after seeing what he saw, screams out and runs out of the apartment. He runs down the stairs, out the access doors, and begins vomiting on the grass and sobbing right next to Frank and Patricia. Naturally, Frank and Patricia, after seeing this, are immediately concerned that something's wrong with their daughter. And so they run inside, they go up the stairs, and they start running into the apartment. And the police officer and the building manager, they try to stop them from getting in, but there was nothing stopping them. They managed to push past those two. They get into the living room and they're calling out for their daughter. And eventually they make their way over to the side of the couch and they see their daughter, Christine. She is lying on the ground in front of the couch. She's on her back. She has no clothes on and she's been stabbed to death. And whoever has killed her has positioned her in this very suggestive, sexual, lewd position as if they were trying to demean her as much as possible and shock whoever found her. And so after these totally devastated and wrecked parents are escorted out of the apartment, this one police officer, he continues searching the apartment. And so he searches the rest of the first floor. There's no sign of Sonia. He goes upstairs and he finds Sonia. She's laying on her bed. She also has no clothes on. She's been stabbed to death. And she's positioned on the side of the bed in a sort of suggestive lewd position, much like Christine downstairs. It would later be determined that that Christine had been sexually assaulted, but Sonia had not been. The officer at this point leaves the apartment. He goes outside. He walks past the grieving parents who are being consoled by the building manager and the maintenance worker. And the officer goes over to his car and he uses his radio to call in for backup. A forensics team comes out to the apartment and they begin processing the scene. And right away, they discover on the outside of the door frame of the door leading into the apartment, there were markings on the edge that looked like someone had used a screwdriver or some similar instrument to pop open the door. They also found there was a towel and some soap that was lying on the ground near Christine's body and near the couch that had apparently been used to both clean Christine's body and also clean some other parts of the apartment. And so they believe this was done to try to intentionally destroy evidence, suggesting the killer or killers were somewhat sophisticated. They also discovered there was some residue on Christine's wrists that indicated at some point her hand hands had been bound by duct tape. But when she was found, her hands were not bound and there was no duct tape from her wrists. And so whoever had done this had at some point removed the duct tape and taken it away. And so investigators believed that the killer or killers had used the duct tape to immobilize Christine for the attack. And then after she was deceased, they had removed that tape in order to be able to get her arms up over her head, which seemed to increase the shock value of this lewd position they had put her in. Based on what they saw inside of this apartment, the police were convinced they were up against a group of killers or a killer that had targeted these two girls, that this was not some random attack, that this was calculated, this was on purpose. And if they didn't get caught, they were going to strike again. And so even though the police really didn't have any leads to operate on, they just had this crime scene and they were looking for maybe someone with duct tape and a knife and a screwdriver. I mean, that was really about it at this point. And so even though they have virtually nothing, because there were thousands thousands and thousands of young people flooding Gainesville for the start of the new school year at the University of Florida. Literally the following day, Monday, classes were starting. Because of all these young people in town, the police felt it was very important that they got the media to put out a bulletin to all these people in town that there was potentially a killer or killers on the loose. And so that night, Sunday evening, this news bulletin goes out and it basically just told residents of Gainesville to stay stay indoors and stay in groups. And if you needed to go outside, travel in groups and just overall stay vigilant until we figure out who did this. 
12 hours before Christine Powell and Sonia Larson were discovered, an 18-year-old Gainesville woman named Krista Hoyt did not show up for work. Krista was a student at Santa Fe Community College, which was right down the road from the University of Florida. That year, she was planning to transfer to the University of Florida. And then after graduation, she wanted to pursue a career in forensics with the FBI. And so given her interest in law enforcement, while she was a student, she had gotten a part-time job working in the records department of the sheriff's office. And apparently at this sheriff's office, she was famous for always coming to work, no matter what including the time that she got her wisdom teeth removed and then an hour after coming home, she showed up for work. And so on this Saturday night when Krista was supposed to be showing up for work and she didn't and she didn't call ahead and no one could get in touch with her on her landline, everybody at the sheriff's office was really concerned. And so they waited around for about an hour hoping that she might just show up with some story about why she was late, but she never showed up, she didn't call, they still couldn't get in touch with her. And so in the very early hours of Sunday morning, morning, the sheriff's office called the Gainesville police and asked them to do a welfare check on Krista. And so two police officers from the Gainesville Police Department, they show up at the apartment belonging to Krista Hoyt. Krista lived alone and she lived about two miles away from Christine Powell and Sonia Larson. And so these two officers, they get there and they walk up to the front door and they knock, but there's no answer. And they try the doorknob, it's locked. And so one of the officers walks around to the back of this apartment and he sees there's a glass sliding door. And so he knocks on the glass sliding door. There's no answer. He tries the door. It's locked. And then he notices the drape that's inside the apartment that's covering up this sliding glass door. It reaches almost to the ground, but not all the way. There's a couple of inches on the bottom where if you were laying on the ground, you could actually look through this little space and see into the apartment. And so that's what he does. He lies down and he puts his flashlight up and he looks through this couple inch gap on this window. And as soon as the light illuminates what's inside of this apartment, he finds Krista. Krista is sitting on the edge of a bed that's not that far away from the sliding glass door and she's facing the door. She's kind of hunched over at the edge of the bed. She's got no clothes on and she's got stab marks all over her back and she's missing her head. And her head was next to the bed to the left up on the shelf and it was positioned in such a way that it almost appeared like the head was looking down at the detached body. When this crime scene was processed, the forensics team immediately noticed there were marks on the back sliding glass door where someone had used probably a screwdriver or something similar to pop the door open. And then they also found residue of duct tape on Krista's wrists, but the duct tape was gone. She was found with her hands not bound. It would later be determined that Krista had been sexually assaulted before she had been murdered. The obvious similarities between Krista's crime scene and Christine and Sonia's crime scene were initially only recognized by Gainesville police because much of the information about the two crime scenes was not public. But that night, Sunday evening, when the police went to the media and asked them to put out that bulletin to all Gainesville residents to say that there could be a killer or killers on the loose, it didn't take long for residents of Gainesville and news anchors to begin speculating that you have these two murders that have happened really close together physically. They're less than two miles apart and they've probably occurred within the last 24, 48 hours. So they've happened in rapid succession, they're both unsolved. And so even without intimate details of the crime scene, it wasn't hard to say, I think these two are probably connected. And so that night, Sunday evening, Gainesville really went into a state of panic. And within hours of this news, you had stores all over Gainesville that had sold out their deadbolts and locks, their mace, their stun guns, their baseball bats, their actual guns, their knives. I mean, people were really trying to arm themselves to protect themselves against this unknown threat that was murdering students in Gainesville. And the police, even though they did not come out and substantiate the claims that, you know, perhaps these two homicides are connected, they did believe they were. And so that night, Sunday night, as all this chaos is kind of unfolding in town, the police put hundreds of officers all over the place, on foot, on every street corner. They had police cars and trucks parked all over the place. I mean, the entire town was on an extreme heightened alert because the police believed another attack was imminent. And so all they could do was try to come out in force to try to discourage the killer or killers from striking again. But as it would turn out, it didn't work. By the following morning, so Monday morning, what was happening in Gainesville had gone from just being a Florida story to a national story. And everybody all 
over the country was talking about it. And one woman named Lisa Byers, who was in her 20s, she did not live in Gainesville, but she had a very close friend who did. She was 23-year-old Tracy Paulus. Tracy had taken some years off from college, but that year had decided to go back and give it another go. And so she was enrolled at the University of Florida. And so Lisa called Tracy and said, hey, you know, I'm watching the news. This is crazy what's happening in your town. How are you holding up? And Tracy would tell her that, you know, I'm just as concerned as everybody else. It's terrifying to think there are killer or killers on the loose, but I think I'm okay because I have my roommate. Tracy's roommate was 23-year-old Manny Taboda, who was this big, strong, former football player who was very close with Tracy. The two had never dated, but they had been very good friends for a number of years. And he too had taken some time off of school and had agreed to go back because Tracy had convinced him, you know, come back, get your degree with me and we'll live together. And so when the news broke about these killings happening in their town, Manny had told Tracy that he would protect her, that nothing would happen to her. And so when Lisa heard this from Tracy, that she thought that she was okay because she has Manny and, you know, he'll look after her and they were not planning to really leave the apartment much besides classes, you know, Lisa was reassured, but she was still worried. And so she told Tracy, please give me a call this evening after you come back from classes just to let me know that everything is okay. And so Tracy said she would, and then they hung up. And then that evening, Tracy did not call Lisa back. And so Lisa tried calling Tracy, but no one picked up. And so that night, Lisa went to bed. She was very worried, but she went to sleep. And then early the next morning, which was Tuesday morning, she tried calling Tracy again, but there was no answer. And so Lisa reached out to a mutual friend of theirs that lived in the same apartment complex in Gainesville. His name was Tommy. And so she asked Tommy, can you please go over to Tracy's apartment and make sure she and Manny are okay? And so Tommy said, no problem. I'll give you a call from Tracy's landline once I talk to her. And so about five minutes later, Tracy got a call, she picked it up, and it was Tommy calling from Tracy's landline, and he was just screaming. When the police arrived at Tracy's apartment, they found Tracy in her bedroom, and like the other victims, she had no clothes on, she was positioned on the side of the bed in a very suggestive, lewd position, she had been stabbed to death, and it would turn out she had been sexually assaulted. And then down the hall from Tracy, they found Manny. He was in his bed and he too had been stabbed to death, except he had his clothes on and he was not positioned in a suggestive position. He had kind of died wherever he was and that was the position they found him in. The forensics team, when they processed the scene, they found markings on the outside of the back sliding door where it looked like someone had used a screwdriver to pop open the door. And then on Tracy's wrist, they found that residue from duct tape, but there was no duct tape, it had been removed. At this point to the police, it was undeniable that they were up against a serial killer or killers. And when the news broke that there was now a fourth and fifth victim, and they were both college students, and one of them was now this big strapping man that apparently was taken down just as easily as these other four petite women, this threw Gainesville into an absolute state of pandemonium. Suddenly, it felt like no one could protect them. The people in Gainesville, they were fair game. It didn't matter that police were out in force in the streets and you had people walking around with guns and baseball bats and mace, and you had people locking their doors and sleeping in groups. It was like no measures were actually stopping these killings from happening. Whoever was doing it was killing with impunity. And so that day, Tuesday, you had hundreds and hundreds of students from the University of Florida just leaving the school who just didn't come back. And as for the police, they called in the FBI and the National Guard. And so by that night, Tuesday night, there were literally hundreds of officers and state police officers all over the place. There were helicopters overhead, both police helicopters and news helicopters with spotlights. They had National Guard military style trucks all over the place. And so Gainesville was really at the highest alert you could possibly be on. But even still, the people of Gainesville, they were not going to feel safe until the police made an arrest. And the next day, just 24 hours after Tracy and Manny had been found, the police did just that. After receiving dozens and dozens of tips about one particular individual, they were able to arrest 19-year-old Ed Humphreys, who was a freshman at the University of Florida. They arrested him for domestic abuse because he had actually struck his grandmother in the face. And so they pick him up for domestic abuse, but they set his bail at a whopping $1 million, which is way higher than you would normally expect for a domestic abuse charge. But this was a unique circumstance where he was being arrested for one thing, but really he was being looked at as the suspect of these five 
five homicides. And so the police really needed him to stay behind bars. And this massive bail, that did that. He had no way to pay it. And so while Ed was behind bars, the police began investigating him and they found there was a lot of reasons to believe he was the serial killer. He had shown he was willing to be violent because after all, he punched his grandmother in the face and people that knew him said he was totally mentally unstable and that he hated women and that he would walk around with a knife on his belt basically all the time. And at night, he was known to walk around the forests of Gainesville. There were these very thick forests that kind of butted up against the University of Florida. And he would walk through the forest at night, which put him very close to the different apartment buildings where all the victims were found. And on top of all that, Ed Humphreys just looked like what you would imagine a serial killer would look like. He had all these deep scars all over his face and his eyes looked totally hollow, like he was permanently on drugs. And he was seen smiling at the cameras when he was led in and out of the courtroom. And to make him even more suspicious, as soon as he was arrested, the attack stopped. There were no more slayings in Gainesville. And so naturally, the country believed Ed was the guy. Basically, everyone thought Ed was the guy. But it came back that his blood type was type A, and the killer or killer's blood type, the blood that had been found at the various crime scenes, was type B. Now, this did not clear Ed of guilt because people believed there was a chance that, you know, he could have been involved in some way. Perhaps he had an accomplice or multiple accomplices. But when this news broke, pretty much everybody was back on edge because clearly there's at least one or more killers that are still on the loose. Shortly after this blood type discrepancy presented itself, the FBI approached the Gainesville police and said, hey, why don't you use our VCAP program? VCAP stands for Violent Crime Apprehension Program. And what it was, was this computer program where it allowed investigators to input details of their crime they were investigating. And when they submitted it, it would be compared against this huge database of other crimes in the country. And if there were any similarities with any other crime, those similar crimes would get popped on screen. And so when the Gainesville police input the information from these five student slayings in Gainesville, the computer program spit out a single match. It was from an unsolved triple homicide in 1989 in Shreveport, Louisiana, which is a town located about 800 miles to the northwest of Gainesville. Shreveport, back in the late 1980s, was considered so safe by its residents that many of them didn't lock their front doors and they would leave their car keys just sitting on their front dash. But in 1989, that would all change. On Friday, November 3rd of that year, eight-year-old Sean Grissom was dropped off at his grandfather's house in Shreveport. He was there to celebrate his eighth birthday. And so his grandfather was this 56 year old man named Tom who was divorced and he was getting ready to retire soon. And he was also trying to spend more time with his grandson. And so he was very excited about having Sean over. Also staying at this house with Sean and his grandfather was Sean's aunt, 24 year old Julie Grissom, who was a college student. She was attending Louisiana State University in Shreveport. When Sean was dropped off by his mother at his grandfather's house, the grandfather, Tom, yelled out to the boy's mother and said, you know, I'll have him back by Monday, I'll drop him off, you know, see you later. And so Sean's mother, she leaves, and that day and the following day, she doesn't hear from Sean's grandfather or from Julie. And so come Sunday night, she tries calling them to, you know, see what's going on. She knows they're having a great time and doesn't really want to interrupt them, but she also hasn't heard from them but they don't pick up. She convinces herself that everything is just fine, that I'm sure there's an explanation, and so she ends up going to bed. And so the next morning, Monday morning, when Sean is supposed to be dropped off early enough that she can take him to school, when he doesn't show up, the mother calls the grandfather back and tries to get in touch and figure out what's going on, but she can't get in touch with him. And so she's telling herself that, okay, well, you know, his grandfather must have just dropped him off at school. And so the mother calls Sean's school and the school says, no, we have not seen Sean today and we haven't heard from him. So we don't know what's going on. And so now Sean's mother is terrified. She calls the police and the police actually get in touch with the neighbor of Tom Grissom. And they ask this neighbor, hey, can you go next door and just make sure Tom and Sean and Julie are okay? And so this neighbor says, no problem. They leave their house and immediately they notice as they're looking at Tom's house that the two cars in the driveway had not left since Friday. It was just something the neighbor noticed 
noticed. And then they also noticed that there were two newspapers at the end of the driveway. It was the Monday and Sunday paper. And they knew Tom always read the newspaper. And so the idea that he would just leave them sitting at the end of the driveway, that didn't really add up. And so the neighbor walks around to the front door and they notice there are lights on inside and they knock on the front door, but there's no answer. They try the front door, but it's locked. And so they end up going around to the very back of the house and they're able to get into the house through the garage. And then through the garage, they open another door that leads into the main part of the house. And this neighbor, they immediately see on the ground towards the back door near the kitchen is Tom. He's laying on the ground and he's obviously deceased. And so this neighbor, they run out, they call the police, the police come back over, they go inside the house and sure enough, they find Tom Grissom has been stabbed to death. He's laying on the ground near the back door. They find Sean Grissom, the eight-year-old, he's slouched over on the couch in front of the TV and he's been stabbed to death as well. And then upstairs, they found 24-year-old Julie, the aunt, and she was positioned on the edge of the bed in this very suggestive way. She had no clothes on and she had been stabbed to death and it would later be determined she had also been sexually assaulted before she was killed. And they also discover there's vinegar on her body as if whoever's done this has attempted to clean her with vinegar. There was no sign of a robbery in the house or ransacking in the house. There was no sign of forced entry. Overall, the investigators said this was a very neat crime scene as if whoever did this had done this with great intentionality. And so after kind of going through the crime scene, the police really didn't have any leads to go off of. And so this crime went unsolved. And so as these Gainesville police are looking at this report in this VCAP computer system, and they're reading about this unsolved triple homicide, all they can think about is how unbelievably similar the crime scene was to all the crime scenes of the student slayings. Specifically, that Julie had been arranged in this kind of suggestive pose like the other female victims in Gainesville. And on top of that, it was determined that the blood type of the killer in Shreveport was type B, same as the killer or killers in Gainesville. So there was a match in the blood type. Somehow, after this discovery through this VCAP program, the media found out about this Shreveport unsolved triple homicide and how apparently it was incredibly similar to all these slayings that have taken place in Gainesville. And so before long, that was all every news network all over the United States was talking about. And at first, the police in Gainesville and anybody involved in this investigation was very upset about this because one, they probably had a leak that someone was giving information to the press, but two, the press was kind of jeopardizing their investigation because by having these details leaked, the killer or killers could potentially benefit from kind of knowing what the police were thinking about and what they were up to. But as it would turn out, this particular leak would prove to be quite fruitful. Shortly after this news about the Shreveport killing and the student slayings was all over the news. This woman named Cindy who lived in Shreveport, she called the police after watching all the news like everybody else and told the police they really ought to look at this guy, Danny Rawling. Danny Rawling was this 37 year old drifter who was in Shreveport at the time of the Grissom family murders in 1989. And apparently after those murders, he had told Cindy's husband that he quote, had a problem and his problem was he liked stabbing people. And Danny literally always walked around with a huge knife on his waist. He seemed totally mentally unstable. And so this claim that he liked stabbing people, Cindy and her husband took literally and basically told him to stay away from them. And so in one of their last conversations with Danny, Danny actually told Cindy that he planned to leave Shreveport and go someplace where there's lots of beautiful young women that he can just stare at all day long. When police asked Cindy, you know, do you think he's capable of killing all eight of these people? She said, oh yeah. And so the police turned their attention to Danny and began researching his background. And they discovered he was raised in a very abusive household. Specifically, his father really couldn't stand him. They had a really bad relationship. And then when Danny got old enough, he joined the Air Force, but he was kicked out after two years for being mentally unstable. And once he was discharged, he began the string of armed robberies in the 1980s. And he eventually got caught and spent the bulk of the 1980s in prison. 
And then in 1989, when he got out of prison, he came back to Shreveport and moved in with his parents. Now, this was not a happy homecoming. His parents did not want him living with them, but Danny kind of forced the issue. He had nowhere else to go. And so he wound up living there. And as it happened, they lived less than a half mile away from the Grissom family home. Six months after the Grissom family was murdered and three months before the Gainesville student slayings had begun, Danny gets in this huge fight with his father where his father actually draws a pistol and forces Danny to leave the house and tells him to never come back. And so Danny, he runs out of the house and he gets his gun from his vehicle, comes back inside his house and shoots his father point blank in the head and then in the stomach before fleeing the scene. His father would amazingly survive this attack despite some pretty significant damage to his head. And he would tell the police and before long, there was a warrant for Danny's arrest for attempted murder, but when they went to go arrest him, he was gone. They had no idea where he went. And so as the Gainesville police are looking at Danny's criminal record, they're starting to say to themselves that this guy looks really interesting. He does seem like he could be the serial killer we're looking for. And so as they continue to dig deeper and deeper, one of the Gainesville police officers suddenly thinks of something. There was this unsolved armed robbery of this bank in Gainesville that happened the same week where all five of these students had been killed. A lone masked gunman walked into this bank in broad daylight and demanded money from the teller. And the teller who thought on their feet gave him the cash, but it was the type that was booby trapped with dye packets. Meaning if this robber tried to tamper with the money at all, it would detonate sending dial over them and kind of making it obvious that this money had been stolen. But the robber doesn't see this. He takes the bag of cash. He leaves the bank and manages to flee and go into the forest before the police show up. And so the police ultimately, they go and search the forest and they find this campsite deep in the woods and at this campsite, which is abandoned, they don't find the person who robbed the bank, but at this campsite, they find the bag that has the money inside of it and the dye packet has been activated so clearly the robber had tried to fiddle with it and then when it detonated, they had taken off and left the money. And then also at this campsite near this duffel bag full of ruined money was a screwdriver, a gun, and an audio recorder. Now, at the time, the police that were seeing this, they were part of this huge effort in Gainesville to stop any more attacks on students and catch the killer or killers. That was all they were thinking about. And so when they didn't immediately catch this robber, they kind of said, you know what? This is a lower priority item than what we're dealing with, with this loose serial killer or killers. And so let's just round up the evidence, put it in storage, and somebody else can deal with this after we handle this killer situation. And so no one listened to the audio recording. They just put it in evidence. They grabbed everything else, put it in evidence, and they threw it in the storage room. And so now this Gainesville police officer that's just remembered this unsolved armed robbery, he says to the group that's investigating Danny, he says, you know, hey, since Danny has a penchant for armed robbery, clearly he has a rap sheet full of armed robberies, maybe if he was the serial killer and he killed all these students, that would have meant he was in Gainesville. And so maybe he committed this armed robbery. And so we should go look at the evidence and listen to that tape. And so the officers, they practically run to the storage locker. They get the evidence from this unsolved armed robbery. They come back and they hit play on this audio recorder. And what they hear is unbelievable. They hear on this recording, a man singing a song. It's clearly a song he wrote. And he's singing about being a quote, mystery killer. And then it kind of segues into him talking about how to effectively kill a deer with a knife, to be really effective with a knife. And he's getting into really graphic detail of how to do that. And then somewhat unbelievably on this audio recording, the man identifies himself. He says his name is Danny Rawling. And so this audio recording was huge. It meant Danny Rawling, the guy they're looking at as potentially being the serial killer, was definitely in Gainesville, in the woods near the University of Florida, the same time frame that all of the victims were killed. Also, the screwdriver that had been found at this campsite matched the markings that had been made along the outside of some of the door frames of the victims' homes. They also went into Danny's military records and it showed he had a blood type of B. So his blood type matched the blood type that had been found in all of the victims' homes. And so just like that, Danny became the number 
one suspect. And when they went to figure out where he was, amazingly, they found he was already in custody. He was being held in a jail cell 40 miles south of Gainesville for another armed robbery. And so immediately, Danny was charged in the murders of the five Gainesville students. They couldn't charge him for the three Shreveport murders because they just didn't have enough evidence. And then after that, Danny was transferred to Florida's maximum security prison to await trial. Initially, Danny said he was innocent, he had nothing to do with the murders, but then then almost four years later, when his trial was finally starting on the first day of his trial, he surprised everyone in the court when he stood up and said, I'm going to change my plea. I'm guilty on all five counts. I did kill all five students. He would tell the court the reason he did this is he wanted to be a superstar like the notorious serial killer Ted Bundy, who he looked up to. Danny would also, at another date, confess to killing the three Grissom family members in Shreveport. Because of Danny's detailed confessions, we now know all the terrifying details of what actually happened when he killed all eight of his victims. Back on Friday, November 3rd, 1989, Danny was fired from his job as a waiter at a local restaurant in Shreveport. And so he was frustrated, he was angry, and he was kind of walking around his neighborhood when he decided the way he would kind of channel his frustration was he would go kill some people. And so he was armed with his K-Bar knife, which he always carried with him. And he found himself standing in front of this little house and he saw some people moving around inside and he looked around, there wasn't anyone watching him. And so he just walked up to the front door, he tried the handle and it was unlocked. And so before he opened the door, he made sure his knife was in hand. He opened the door, walked right in, and he saw Sean, the eight-year-old, sitting on the couch watching TV. And without any hesitation, he walked up behind him and stabbed him through the back, killing him almost instantly. And then Danny walked into the kitchen where he found Tom, the grandfather, who was making steaks out on the back grill. And so he was going back and forth between the kitchen and the grill, kind of getting ready for dinner. And at some point, when Tom came back into the house and was holding steaks in his hand, Danny Danny leapt out and stabbed him, and even though Tom put up a fight, he was very quickly subdued as well. And then after that, Danny made his way upstairs where Julie was, that was Sean's aunt, and she was getting ready for a wedding she was going to attend that night for one of her friends. And so she had just gotten out of her shower and she was getting ready to put on this red dress she had picked out, and Danny walked into her room and she most likely saw him, at which point Danny would have told her what he had just done to her loved ones downstairs. And he threatened her with the knife and said, if you don't listen to me, I'm gonna do the same thing to you. And because she was terrified, she listened to him, and so he immobilized her. Her, and then he sexually assaulted her and then he stabbed her to death. Afterwards, he cuts the tape off of her wrists and puts the tape in his pocket. And then he lays her out on her back on her bed. And then he goes downstairs and gets some vinegar and uses the vinegar to attempt to clean her body to destroy any evidence he might have left behind. And then after cleaning her, he kind of puts her in that lewd suggestive pose with her hands up over her head and her legs spread. And then he leaves. Six months later in August of 1990, after Danny has shot his father and is on the run from the law, he finds himself in Gainesville, Florida, and he sets up this little camp just behind the University of Florida in this thick forest. And then on Friday, August 23rd, as he's sitting out at his campsite, he gets this sudden urge to go kill again. And so he waits for it to get dark out, and then he gets out his audio recorder, and he records himself alluding to this murder he's about to go perpetrate. Then, armed with a pistol, a screwdriver, and his K-Bar knife, he left his campsite and walked in the darkness in the forest about a mile away until he was looking from inside the forest out towards this three-story white apartment building. And it's believed that within the last 24 hours, he had been in that area and he had seen two young girls go in and out of this apartment building. And that was all he needed to determine who his victims were going to be. And so those victims were Christine Powell and Sonia Larson. And so when he was standing in front of their apartment building, he eventually strode out of the forest. He walked up to that access door that led him into that stairwell. He made his way up to the door of Christine and Sonia and he used used his screwdriver to pop the door open. He went inside and shut the door behind him and walked into the living room and he found Christine was sleeping on the couch. And so he left her be, he didn't touch her. He went upstairs and he found Sonia sleeping on her bed. And so as he's standing there, realizing that he has these two
two girls. He needs to make a decision about which one he's going to kill first and which one he's going to sexually assault. And so as he's standing there looking over Sonya's bed, he decides he's going to kill Sonya and then he's going to sexually assault Christine. And so very casually, he walks into Sonya's room. She's fast asleep, she's on her back, and he pulls out a piece of duct tape and he gets the duct tape in one hand and he pulls his knife out in the other and he presses the duct tape over her mouth, which wakes her up, and then he drives the knife into her chest. And so Sonya would put up a pretty incredible fight, but ultimately she would succumb to her injuries. And then after she was dead, Danny just left her where she was and he went downstairs and he found Christine was still asleep on the couch. She had not woken up from the commotion upstairs. And so he walked right in front of her and standing over her with his knife, he kind of nudged her awake. And when she woke up, he had a piece of tape, he put it over her mouth and he told her to be quiet and held up the knife and told her that I just killed your roommate. And if you don't listen to what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna kill you too. And so naturally she complied to what he wanted. And so she let her wrists be tied. And then at that point he cut her clothes off, he sexually assaulted her and then he stabbed her to death. And so after she was dead on the ground, he went and got that towel and that soap and he began cleaning Christine's body to try to remove any evidence he might've left behind. And then he cut the duct tape off of her wrist and removed the duct tape from her mouth and put those in his pocket. And then he positioned her in that kind of lewd, suggestive position that she was found in. And then Danny went back upstairs and cut the clothes off of Sonia and then positioned her on the side of the bed in a suggestive position as well. And then Danny leaves the apartment, so he goes, back into the woods. He walks in the wood line back to his campsite. But when he got there, he was just too jacked up. He was too excited from what he had just done that he just couldn't control himself. All he wanted to do was go out and kill again. And so he managed to sit at his campsite for a total of eight hours before he couldn't help it any longer. He had to go back out and find another victim. And so his next victim, he decided, would be this woman he just happened to see a couple of days ago. He was walking down the road near this row of apartments near the school, and he looked into one of them, and he just saw there was this girl in this apartment, and he just thought for a second, you know, I bet she lives alone there. But that was the entire interaction. He didn't know this person. He was just kind of guessing that she might be alone in there. And so here he is in the forest after killing these two teens. And he's like, okay, I'm gonna go back to that apartment because I think that woman is alone. And that woman would be Krista Hoyt. And so in the early morning hours of Saturday, August 24th, Danny leaves his campsite with his screwdriver, his gun, and his K-bar knife. And he walks about a half mile away from his campsite until he's still in the woods, but he's looking out at the back of Krista's apartment. And then at some point he walks out of the forest, he walks right up over her fence and gets up to her back sliding door. He uses a screwdriver to pop the sliding door open, he slides it open, he steps inside, and he finds out that Krista is actually not in her apartment. There's no one in her apartment. But instead of leaving and finding another victim, he decides he'll just wait for Krista. And so he shuts the sliding back door and he goes into her bedroom closet and shuts the closet and then just waits. And he stays in her closet for several hours until around 11 a.m. that morning, Krista comes home. And when she was in the house, he waited a little bit longer to make sure she didn't know he was there. And then at some point he kind of slipped out of the closet, snuck up behind her and put her in a chokehold. Now at first, Krista tried to fight back, but eventually she realized she could not overpower whoever this was. And at that point she said, okay, okay, you know, what do you want? And Danny would tell her, you gotta listen to me or I'm gonna kill you. And he showed her the knife. And so Krista said, okay, and she put her wrists out. He taped her wrists with duct tape. He put tape over her mouth. And then he brought her into her bedroom where he cut her clothes off and sexually assaulted her. And then afterwards he stabbed her to death. Once she was dead, he cut the duct tape off of her wrists and pulled the duct tape off of her mouth and put that duct tape in his pocket. And then he positioned her body on the bed in a suggestive position before he left. When he got back to his campsite, he realized he had accidentally left his wallet in Krista's apartment. And so calm as can be, he walked back through the forest, right back into Krista's apartment. He found his wallet and he was about to leave when he thought to himself, well, wait a minute, I should mutilate her body. And so he pulled Krista's body off of the bed and using his knife, he decapitated her. He put her head up on the shelf next to the bed and then he repositioned her body on the edge of the bed, making it seem like she was kind of hunched over looking out the back door. 
And then before he left, he reached up and twisted her decapitated head and made it seem like it was looking down at the rest of her body. 48 hours later, on the evening of Monday, August 27th, Danny was back at his campsite out in the woods and he suddenly got the urge to go kill again. And so he stood up, he grabbed his knife, his screwdriver and his gun, and he walked away from camp, made it about a mile through the woods until he was standing still in the forest, looking out at this big apartment complex that was very commonly occupied by college students. And so at some point he leaves the forest and walks up to the first apartment he sees. He has no idea who's gonna be in there. And he goes up to their sliding back glass door. He gets a screwdriver out and he pops it open. He slides the door open, he steps inside, and the first thing he sees is Manny Tabota, this big, strong, former football player who's laying in his bed. And Danny just walks over and starts stabbing him, and Manny wakes up and puts up one heck of a fight, but ultimately Danny is able to overpower him and kills him. While Danny was stabbing Manny, the other resident inside of this apartment, 23-year-old Tracy Paulus, she was in the shower, and so she gets out of the shower and she hears all this commotion down the hall and so she steps into the hall and she looks into Manny's room and she sees Danny on top of him stabbing him and so Danny looks back he sees Tracy Tracy screams she runs down the hall into her bedroom she slams the door behind her she locks it and then she leans up against the door to try to keep it shut meanwhile Danny just continues to stab Manny until Manny is dead and then Danny stands up and he just walks down the hall, calm as can be. He gets to the bedroom door where he knows Tracy is. She's trapped, she can't go anywhere. And he begins to smash the door down. He's ramming it with the shoulder, he's kicking it over and over again and Tracy's screaming for him to stop. But eventually he manages to just kick the door down. And as soon as he's inside the room, Tracy kind of stands back and she says to Danny, are you the one? And Danny looks at her and says, yes, I am the one. And then he threatened her with the knife and said, I'll kill you just like the guy down the hall unless you listen to me. And so Tracy listened. She got her wrist bound and her face bound. And then Danny cut the clothes off of her and then sexually assaulted her. And then he stabbed her to death. And then after she was dead, he cut the duct tape off of her wrists and removed the duct tape from her mouth and then positioned her body in a suggestive sexual position on the edge of the bed. And then he left. Later that day, Danny would rob that bank in Gainesville. And then one month later, Danny would be arrested for a botched armed robbery 40 miles south of Gainesville. And then while he was in prison, he would find out he was being charged with the five murders in Gainesville. 16 years later at 6 p.m. on October 25th, 2006, Danny Rawling was led into the execution chamber in Florida State Prison. He offered no apology to the family members of his victims that were on the other side of the glass. Instead, Danny just sang a religious hymn to himself in order to comfort himself. And then 13 minutes later, Danny was pronounced dead. He was executed via lethal injection. So that's gonna do it guys. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please hide outside of the like button's house while they are watching game seven of the World Series. And anytime the game starts to get really good, change their channel using your universal remote. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly one or two video uploads. We are now selling merchandise like flannels and hats and sweatshirts and mugs and all sorts of stuff. If you're interested, go to shopmrballin.com. If you wanna learn about upcoming deals and promotions in our shop, go to our shop's Instagram page. The username is shopmrballin. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's Mr. Ballin. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin as well. We also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ball and Shorts, where we post random short videos and lost episodes. We also have a Facebook page just called Mr. Ballin, where we post condensed versions of longer episodes you see on YouTube. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate it. Then you're in luck because our very popular Strange, Dark, and Mysterious podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast is no longer exclusively on Amazon Music. It is now available on all podcast platforms and it's free. 
So if you haven't listened to the Mr. Ballin podcast since it went exclusive in 2022 with Amazon, well, buckle up because now there's over 200 episodes on this show and many of them have never been told on YouTube. They are only available on the podcast and you got all of them right now to go binge. You can find those special podcast exclusive episodes just by looking for the words podcast exclusive in the individual episode title. So again, the chart topping, highly popular Mr. Ballin podcast is once again available on all podcast platforms and it's free. To listen, just search for the Mr. Ballin podcast on Amazon Music or wherever else you listen to your podcasts and then give the show a follow and start listening. Also, if you're one of the amazing people who continued listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast on Amazon Music when it went exclusive, well, don't give up your subscription just yet because there are still major perks for people listening to the show on Amazon Music. With your Prime membership, you can listen to brand new episodes of the Mr. Ballin podcast 30 days earlier and ad-free on Amazon Music. But again, the show is available on all podcast platforms and it's free, so go enjoy. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's story, be sure to check out our podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, where we have literally hundreds more stories, a lot like this one, but many of those stories are only available on the podcast. Again, it's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and you can listen to it on Amazon Music or wherever else you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. Until next time, see ya. Wait, don't go anywhere. If you're looking for more strange, dark, and mysterious videos, click here. As many of you may know, the biggest event ever to come out of Ballin Studios is fast approaching. From September 26th to October 20th, I will be on tour. I'll be visiting 15 cities across the United States, telling strange, dark, and mysterious stories live and in person. Last year, we did one show. It was a sold out show in Austin, Texas to kind of trial run this concept. And it's basically just me on stage telling stories and people loved it. And there was huge demand for more. And so here we are doing 15 more shows. Tickets for these 15 shows have been selling very quickly, but there are still tickets available if you act basically right now. All you have to do is go to tour.ballinstudios.com, find the show that is, you know, nearest you or whichever one you're interested in, click on the link, and if there are tickets still available, you can buy them through that link. And if you're lucky, there might even be some VIP tickets left, which will give you access to meet this guy, if that's of interest to you. Also, just for our VIP ticket holders, bring your copy of our graphic novel and I'll sign it for you when we meet. And so the way you get the book is either you have already pre-ordered it or you can buy a copy at the theater. We'll be selling them on site. Again, I'm gonna be on tour from September 26th to October 20th, telling stories in person. It's gonna be great. If you wanna go, there are still tickets, but they're going quick. Just go to tour.ballinstudios.com and get your tickets today. Okay, back to the stories. We've all been there. You're the host for the big summer barbecue, the guests are on their way, and you realize right at that moment as you're pulling it out of the oven that you've overcooked your zebra cornea souffle. With only minutes to spare, you leap head first out of your kitchen window, shattering the glass, cutting your body badly, and then you run into the nearby jungle and you tackle a wallaby and you knock a few teeth loose, you grab those teeth, you run back to your house, you die, you, you die. <laughs> You dive back into your house head first through a different window. You cut yourself up badly again. You get inside your kitchen and you whip together a wallaby teeth salad just in time as your guests are coming in the door and right before you pass out from blood loss. Crisis averted, right? Wrong. Zebra cornea souffle and wallaby teeth salad, they're not good. But what is good is HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a meal service that delivers actually good tasting food right to your doorstep. Between menu items like cheese stuffed burgers and grilled salmon with balsamic tomatoes, you are not only going to wow your barbecue guests, but also you're going to avoid jail time for poaching wallabies and zebras, and you're going to avoid expensive medical and repair bills from all the jumping out the windows you were doing. Hello fresh recipes include pre-portioned ingredients, which means less prep time and less wasted food. HelloFresh also offers a line of kid-friendly recipes that are perfect for families that are looking to try something new as the summer winds down and we get ready for school to start.
start up again. So if you're ready to stop choking down zebra corneas and wallaby teeth, then you need to sign up for HelloFresh today. To do that, go to HelloFresh.com and use code MrBallin16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. Again, go to HelloFresh.com and use code MrBallin16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. Okay, back to the story. Before we go any further, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Experian. Back when I was just a young buck in college, I was broke. And so naturally, I took out a credit card with a $5,000 limit and immediately maxed it out on buffalo chicken calzones and beer. Now, as soon as my card got declined, I didn't pay it off. Instead, I just took the card, tucked it back into my wallet, and forgot about it. But the bank did not forget about my $5,000 debt, and my failure to pay it back wrecked my FICO score. A FICO score is a type of credit score. Over the last 10 years, I've been able to rebuild my credit score, but it has been a slow and painful process. And so my suggestion to you is to avoid the unpaid beer and calzone credit trap and just closely monitor your credit score. And with Experian, you can do that for free. In addition to closely monitoring your credit score, they will also send you alerts anytime your credit changes. Experian also offers a dark web scan. If you've ever been the victim of a data breach and you may not know if you have or not, your information potentially could live in the dark web. And that's a place where criminals could use it to commit fraud. And if that happens, it'll wreck your credit along with a bunch of other horrible things, unless you catch it and report it. And on that, if you do find inaccurate accuracies on your credit report, you can easily submit disputes and track those disputes on Experian's online dispute center. It is time to take charge of your credit. Get Experian credit monitoring, alerts, your FICO score, and that dark web scan all for free. Just go to Experian.com slash Mr. Ballin. Again, that's E-X-P-E-R-I-A-N.com slash Mr. Ballin. Okay, back to the story. <laughs> 